it's a warm summer's day in one of the world's most picturesque cities. Bienvenue à Montréal. Welcome to Montreal, a city that well represents all the beauty of Canada and a city where the traditions of the past stand side by side with the changes of today. Montreal is no stranger to history and no stranger to the world of sports. And today, both will be joined once again as the game of baseball takes another step into the future. It's an international celebration, the 1982 All-Star Game at Olympic Stadium in Montreal. This rendezvous in Montreal is the 53rd gathering of the All-Stars. And as always, it's an opportunity for a close-up look at the best in baseball. A talented National League squad is looking to extend its 10-game victory streak while an equally impressive American League team hopes to snap that string, all amidst the swirl of pregame pageantry. As the players from both teams are being introduced, the cheers cascade down from the sellout crowd of more than 59,000. But the loudest shouts are saved for the five favorites from the hometown Montreal Expos, one of whom is Gary Carter. With a popularity that extends from coast to coast, Carter received more than two and a half million votes on all-star ballots, making him the recipient of the Gillette Trophy as the most popular selection of the fans. A salute to international baseball is a fitting theme for the first All-Star game outside the United States. And now honored are 12 former greats who hail from countries as diverse as Korea, Venezuela, Canada, and Japan. One is Bobby Thompson, a mainstay of the old New York Giants. Born in Glasgow, Scotland, Thompson will never be forgotten for his pennant-winning home run against the Dodgers in 1951. For the Scottish-born Thompson, it was truly a shot heard round the world. Along with Thompson, another member of baseball's international fraternity is Minnie Minoso, born on the island of Cuba. A solid hitter and a strong runner, Minoso batted over 300 eight times and on three different occasions led the American League in stolen bases. Highly popular with fans everywhere, Minoso spent the better part of his career with the Chicago White Sox. And as a member of the White Sox, many played in seven All-Star games, compiling a sterling 400 batting average while always looking good in the field. Joining Minoso is another standout from the Caribbean, Juan Marichal of the Dominican Republic. Marichal raced to the big leagues with the San Francisco Giants, thanks to a brilliant array of pitches that often put hitters in a daze. By kicking his way to eight All-Star appearances, the Dominican Dandy was a 20-game winner six different times. With memories in many a language, the 12 international heroes are joined by the game's honorary captains. First, Yogi Berra of the American League. In his 18 seasons as a Yankee, Yogi was nothing less than a winner. His World Series records and membership in the Hall of Fame attest to that. And as a 15-time All-Star catcher, Yogi always seemed to get the upper hand. Barra's National League counterpart is Duke Snyder, the Brooklyn Dodgers' Duke of Flatbush. A Hall of Famer himself and seven-time All-Star, Snyder was one of the great home run hitters in the National League. 
No stranger to Montreal fans, the Duke played minor league ball with the old Montreal Royals. And today he's doing play-by-play -play for the Expos broadcast team. The pregame festivities are brought to a close, and the rising excitement throughout the ballpark means only one thing. In any language, it's time to play ball. And as the slate is clean for both teams, the game begins. On the mound for the National League is Montreal's Steve Rogers, 10 and 4 thus far in 82. While lining up in the starting blocks is Oakland speedster Ricky Henderson leading off. Henderson is on base, and right away that's trouble for the National League. Looking back on the season, it's the same kind of trouble Rick the Quick has been causing American League teams every chance he gets. And in one word, that trouble is speed. Pure, electrifying speed. With spine-tingling speed, Henderson has been burning away the pages of the record book, and he's right on track to smashing Lou Brock's single season mark of 118 steals as he becomes baseball's new stolen base king. Now, Henderson is held close to first as Kansas City's George Brett, an all-star for the sixth time, steps in with one out. American League manager Billy Martin wants to get started, and third base coach Dick Hauser relays the strategy. With no chance to go beyond second, Henderson holds up as he acknowledges the contribution of his all-star teammate on first. Now manager Martin looks to his cleanup hitter. California's high-flying angel, Reggie Jackson. Let's do it right here. Come on, Wayne. Time you're ready. Come on. Wow, pitch. Tom Lasorda was right. The runners move up, and the pitcher knows he's in a jam. Andre Dawson's got it. Henderson scores on the sacrifice fly, and it's one to nothing American League. The next batter is Cecil Cooper, having another outstanding season for the Milwaukee Brewers. Second baseman Manny Trio's throw is not in time, and now there are runners at the corners. And one of the leading run producers in the major leagues is due up next. Right, come on, Robin. Hit them both in. Come on. Looming large is Milwaukee's Robin Yount, waiting for a 3-2 pitch. The strikeout ends the inning, and the National League has dodged a bullet. Nevertheless, for the third straight year, the American League has scored the first run. And now seeking to protect that lead is control pitcher Dennis Eckersley, who coolly sets down five batters in a row. But National League fans get a quick charge in the second inning when their well-turned-out squad begins to stir. With two out, the Major League home run leader, Dale Murphy, is at bat, and in uncharacteristic fashion, Eckersley walks him on four pitches. A base on balls has long been the scourge of many a manager, and the cost of that free pass soon becomes evident as Cincinnati's Dave Concepcion stands in. It's a home run, and for Dave Concepcion, that's something of a rarity. He had hit just one in nearly three months of play this year. So this homer, putting his team ahead 2-1, to one, has to be a special thrill. And for the National League fans of Montreal, it's time for a little international celebration. Lucky 13 gets the high fives, and the Nationals get a 2-1 to one lead after two. 
Western League fails to score in the top of the third. And as the game moves to the bottom half of the inning, Montreal's mascot, Yuppie, is stepping out. Soon, San Diego's Rupert Jones does the same as he finds a way to loosen things up while leading off. Still on the hill for the American League is Dennis Eckersley, and his first pitch to Jones is greeted in rousing fashion. It's a triple for Jones, whose last All-Star appearance had come five years before when he was with Seattle. And after a walk to the next batter, anxious eyes turn to an imposing sight. 15-time All-Star Pete Rose. same only the names change as home plate umpire Doug Harvey finds out when the managers make their substitutions who's this what's his name Quisenberry Quisenberry he's seven right well, you spoke Quisenberry is that close enough okay my man in the sixth, Dan Quisenberry has come on to meet Al Oliver, a bright new face in Montreal and the leading batter in the National League. Getting the right bounces, Oliver pulls into third. And as the hometown fans are singing praises, up comes another Montreal crowd pleaser who's added some lyrics of his own, Gary Carter. In his ninth season with the Expos, catcher Gary Carter has come to be regarded by many as one of the best in baseball at his position. Five times an All-Star, Carter put on a memorable display last year in Cleveland. Two home runs had helped lift the National League to victory and selection as the game's most valuable player. Now, Carter takes aim at opportunity in 1982. Two outs and a runner on third. and there's a snake bit feeling in the other dugout. Like like Giving way to a pinch runner, Carter celebrates the success of the Montreal connection. And the Nationals are out in front four to one at the end of six complete innings. Having been held scoreless since the first inning, the American League has had some opportunities, but just wasn't able to zero in on the likes of Philadelphia's Steve Carlton, who accounted for two of those shutout innings. Carlton set the tone when he faced the always dangerous Cecil Cooper back in the fourth. A baffling slider has helped make Carlton the all-time left-handed strikeout leader. And when he's on, lefty can turn off any lineup, even the best. Carlton struck out the side in the fourth and then fanned another in the fifth to complete his stint. But now in the seventh, another strikeout ace, Mario Soto of the Reds, finds the American League getting back in the swing with Lance Parrish at bat. The Detroit slugger steams into second with a double, and the American League now looks like it might be on a roll as Ricky Henderson squares off with one man out. Second baseman Steve Sachs covers the ground, but his throw is off. 
Meanwhile, Dick Hauser applies the brakes. Pick up the ball, stay right here now. Catcher's got the ball. Catcher's got the ball. Suddenly, there are runners at first and third, and the Major League batting leader at a hefty 340, Willie Wilson, is coming to the plate. The heat is on with the American League getting to the heart of its lineup. And as Soto works to Wilson, the pressure continues to build. It's a frustrating strikeout for Wilson, but the Nationals aren't out of it yet. And the Dominican-born Soto is well aware of that as he faces pinch-hitting Buddy Bell. Now on second with a stolen base is Henderson and Parrish is still 90 feet away. Striking out the side, Mario Soto, in the tradition of countryman Juan Marichal, has delivered in style. Fired up National League squad has just avoided another close call, holding on to its 4-1 to lead. And the tightrope walk continues as the Nationals turn to another bell ringer. Mexico's Fernando Valenzuela on to pitch in the eighth. The late inning tension is apparent, and the words of encouragement are bilingual. With two out, Fernando yields his second walk of the inning. And not wishing to take any chances with two men on, manager Lasorda decides to remove his left-handed ace. The call goes to right-hander Greg Minton of the Giants, who soon gets some quick managerial inspiration and advice on how to pitch to the next batter. Hey, hey, yeah, he likes this. The low ball hitter, keep the ball inside on him and keep it up. Uh, you can curve him, yeah, come on. Meanwhile, Lance Parrish is told what he can expect. It'll probably be met, and he's a sinker. Just stays right downstairs. You make it swing at the ball below your knee. They you gotta make him get the ball up. He pitches down, down, down. It's kind of a three-quarter to sidearm guy, and the ball just keeps diving. Now, in a crucial situation, the game moves from consultation to confrontation. From out of nowhere, shortstop Ozzie Smith to make the play. Congratulations all around for Ozzie Smith, the St. Louis Cardinals' Wizard of Oz. A touch of gold has held the American League in check once more. But in the bottom of the eighth, catcher Lance Parrish of the Tigers returns the favor with diamond gems of his own. Al Oliver leads off first with nobody out, and Parrish gets set to make all-star history picking up his third assist as he throws out his third base runner of the night. 1982 has brought recognition to Lance Parrish. At the All-Star break, he was leading the Tigers with a 324 batting average and was on his way to the American League home run record for catchers. He's a dominant force at bat or in the field. But what characterizes Lance Parrish best is his winning determination. Now Parrish is determined again. Watch the dugout, Lance. Watch the dugout. Parrish's gutty play ends the inning. And as the game moves into the ninth, the National League is still ahead by a three-run margin. The ninth is an inning of maneuvers from the bench and the bullpen. After an out and a walk, Greg Minton gives way to Steve Howe, who gets another out and then a souvenir. He wants to take that ball with him as a souvenir. Is that all right? Hell no. Huh? Yeah. What did he do? I am too. Thanks, Doug. There you go, Tommy. Get this guy. Come on, go hard. Here, let's go. Nice job, son. As anyone who's been there might tell you, a trip to the All-Star Game is a memory worth holding on to. And for the next National League pitcher, this is a first-time thrill. 
Tom Hume of the Cincinnati Reds looks in to find Buddy Bell with two outs in the ninth. Dale Murphy's there, and the National League has taken another hard-fought victory, this time 4-1. to one. It's the 11th straight and 19th out of the past 20. An amazing winning spree, considering the talent that both teams always assemble. All right! That's 11 in a row! Oh, yeah! Don't have to worry about that game till next year. And next year, the American League will have another chance at the scene of one of its greatest victories, Chicago's Comiskey Park. It was there in 1933 that the American League won the first All-Star game ever played. And the hero of that historic day was none other than Babe Ruth, who belted the Midsummer Classic's first home run. That began an era of domination by the American League, which won three games in a row and 12 of the first 16. In 1983, the All-Star Game will be 50 years old, a true golden anniversary. Back in Montreal, baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn and National League president Chubb Feeney join in saluting Dave Concepcion winner of the Commissioner's Trophy as the game's most valuable player. With his startling home run in the second inning, Concepcion delivered the winning run, and it seems altogether fitting that on this occasion of international celebration, Dave Concepcion of Venezuela should be named MVP. And so ends a true all-star night for baseball in Montreal and all around the world.